Welcome to The Point, the radio ministry of Grace Point Missionary Baptist Church of Brownwood, Texas. On this show, we get right to the point, which is learning about the Lord through a study of the Scriptures. So grab your Bible and follow along with Pastor Leland Acker. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 26. We're going to be looking in verses 9 through 18. Acts chapter 26, verses 9 through 18. Now, what's going on here in Acts chapter 26 is the Apostle Paul has been on his missionary journeys. He's returned to Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem, you have the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They're not happy that he's been traveling the world, spreading the gospel and spreading Christianity. And so to make a long story short, they've had him arrested, and now the Apostle Paul is testifying before King Agrippa, and in the course of uh, testifying before King Agrippa, he gets to tell his experience of how he came to know Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. And that's always an important part of anybody's testimony, how they came to be who they are. And if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, think to yourself, when was the last time you were you actually told somebody how it was that you became a Christian? There's a pretty good lesson to learn there. The Apostle Paul, by the way, did the same thing when he testified before King Felix as well. All right, here we go. Acts chapter 26, verse 9. This is Paul testifying to King Agrippa. He said, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Whereupon I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Now, when we first meet the Apostle Paul, he's not an apostle. In fact, he doesn't even go by the name of Paul. When we first meet Paul, he is going by the name of Saul, and he is a Pharisee. Going back to Acts chapter 9, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was uh, zealous of the law, enthusiastic about the law of Moses, enthusiastic about the Jewish traditions, the Jewish religion. And so when Christianity began to spread, Paul began to do everything within his power to oppose it, to stop it. And he began to persecute Christians and persecute those who followed after Jesus Christ. And in doing that, he was disobeying the wisdom that was set forth by his mentor, a man named Gamaliel. Now, Gamaliel was one of the more wise Jews in the Jewish Sanhedrin, which would have been like their senate. He was, the, he was the voice of wisdom that everybody looked to whenever something of controversy had arisen. And Gamaliel had a school, a theological school, a seminary, if you will, and only 15 students were allowed to be enrolled in that school at one time. So Paul was one of those students. And so he had gotten into the finest schools in the nation. And Gamaliel, his mentor, said that if Christianity be of God, then they wouldn't be able to stop it. And if it wasn't of God, it would go away soon enough anyway so that they shouldn't fight against it. Paul was disobeying that wisdom. Not only was he disobeying the wisdom set forth by his instructor, but he was also struggling against the Holy Spirit himself. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about struggling against the Holy Spirit, struggling against God and fighting against God. And this is something you think of the Apostle Paul And you think of his salvation experience on the road to Damascus, and you often think of the sinner coming to repentance after being confronted with their sin and turning from their sin and trusting Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And indeed, that's a proper application to make from this passage. 
But oftentimes Christians, those who already know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, can overlook this, and uh, they can say, well, that's a salvation passage. I've already got that covered. Oftentimes Christians find themselves struggling against the Holy Spirit as well and struggling against God's will as well. And we need to realize that it is possible for us to make the same mistakes today. It's possible for us to become so centered around our own lives and what we find interest in that we find ourselves fighting against God, fighting against the will of God, fighting against the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And when this happens, we are either on the road to destruction or we're on the road to a major confrontation with God, and neither one of those is a pleasant place to be, all right? So this morning, we're going to look at the struggle that Paul had, and we're going to look at how that might mirror some of the same struggles we have in our own lives. And so we're going to look at what it means to kick against the pricks and what that comes out of verse 14, where Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. We're going to talk about what that means. We're also going to talk about how people persecute Christ, and then we're going to talk about repentance. So first, let's talk about kicking against the pricks. Now, a prick was a long, sharp, pointed stick that farmers used. What you would do is you'd hook your ox up to your plow, and that ox would pull that plow, and you're holding it, the handle of the plow, and you're pushing the plow through the dirt. The ox is pulling the plow through the dirt. And as you went along, if you've ever done any kind of agriculture, you've done any kind of plowing, especially by hand, tilling, what have you, and you get to a certain point in the garden spot, sometimes the plow hits a rock or, or a root or something, and the plow stops. And when the ox would hit that resistance, the natural thing for the ox to do would just to be to stop. And so what the prick was, the long, sharp, pointed stick that the farmer used, it was that long, pointed stick that the farmer would take the prick and jab that ox in the rear hind quarter there, and that would encourage the ox to continue to pull until the root or the rock was dislodged. Now, you can imagine for the ox, kicking against that prick would prove to be futile. It didn't accomplish anything. It was also a painful experience for the ox. For the ox. Here, Jesus uses the picture of the prick and the ox to describe Paul's rebellion against the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was prodding Paul to accept Christianity, and Paul was kicking back against the prick, was kicking back against the Holy Spirit. Now, how did Paul do this? How did this manifest itself in Paul's life? How did Paul kick against the pricks? How did he fight against the Holy Spirit? We look in verse 9. Paul said, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Paul was familiar with Jesus, and uh, he knew who Jesus was as a person, and Paul was probably aware of how Jesus met the scriptural qualifications of being Messiah. Paul was an expert in the law, an expert in the Old Testament. He had memorized it as a boy growing up in school. He had gone to the finest university in Tarsus. He grew up in Tarsus, lived in Tarsus. Tarsus was the university city back in those days. And then his father sent him down to Jerusalem to study in the school of Gamaliel. So Paul knew what the Old Testament said, and when you read his writings later on in the New Testament, and he is constantly quoting Old Testament scripture to show how Jesus met the, those Old Testament scriptures and how he fulfilled them, you'll see that Paul probably had an idea that Jesus was indeed the Christ. But his zeal and his enthusiasm for the Jewish religion blinded Paul to the point that he sought to, to eliminate the spread of Christianity. And he sought to persecute the disciples of Jesus Christ. He was trying to exterminate Christianity back in his day because he was so enthusiastic about the religion that he had before Christ. And in doing so, he actually found himself fighting against the Lord himself. Now, Paul knew who he was up against. He, this, this incident on the road to Damascus, while it may have been shocking and it may have been surprising, it didn't surprise Paul who it was that was behind it. In verse 15, Paul says, And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Now this, when Paul said, Who art thou, Lord? It was a rhetorical question, first of all, because he addressed him as Lord. So he didn't, he didn't say, Who are you? Are you some strange deity that I haven't met before? Are you an alien? No, he said, Who are you, Lord? It was a rhetorical question, a rhetorical question that was born out of the fact that God was not conforming to the image that Paul had 
made for himself in his mind. Paul had an image of God. He had an idea of who he thought God was. And with Jesus having died for the sins of the world, and with Jesus empowering the disciples through the Holy Spirit, God was not conforming to Paul's idea of God, and so there was a little bit of frustration. Paul says, who art thou, Lord? He addresses him as Lord. And Jesus said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Now, Jesus didn't have to explain, hey, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. I was born in a, in a stable in Bethlehem. I died for your sins on the cross. He didn't have to explain all that to Paul because Paul already knew all that. See, uh, Paul had already stated in verse 9 that he had thought that he should do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So Jesus did not have to explain who he was and which Jesus he was. Paul already knew. Jesus just proclaimed that he was the one whom Paul was fighting against. The Lord confirmed who he is. So Paul kicked against the pricks by persecuting the disciples of Christ. He fought against the Holy Spirit by persecuting the disciples of Christ. Jesus said in verse 14, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Paul's rebellion against the Holy Spirit constituted the kicking of the pricks. Moreover, Paul was probably convicted each and every time he saw a Christian killed for his faith. Now you think about that for a second. You know, if you put, if you threaten somebody with death unless they renounce their faith and they would rather die than renounce their faith, then you get the idea that they honestly believed what they were getting ready to die for. And each and every time someone died proclaiming Jesus Christ as their personal savior, Jesus Christ as Lord and Messiah, each and every time someone died proclaiming those words in front of Paul, I believe it affected Paul. I believe it bothered Paul. And he goes through this time and time again, imprisoning people and killing people and having people killed. And while he's doing all this, none of them are renouncing their faith. They all are willing to die for the name of Jesus Christ. And that bothered him. And so the Holy Spirit was using that to convict him. The Holy Spirit was using his knowledge of Scripture to convict him. And all this time, Paul is resisting all that. He's fighting against all that. He's kicking back against that sharp stick of the Holy Spirit's conviction and moving forward with the persecution of Christians. And so that was kicking against the pricks. And that's what Jesus meant in verse 14 when he said, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now today, Christians find themselves kicking against the pricks. They don't conform their image of God to scripture. Everybody has that uh, idea, you know, to me, God is like this. To me, God is like this. And when you show them scripture that describes who God really is, if it doesn't, if it doesn't fit, their characteristic of who Je- uh, who Jesus is or who God is, oftentimes they'll just reject that particular scripture. They'll just go on believing in God the way they feel like God exists. But the thing is, is that God existed before any of us existed. And he is the one that created all of us. He is who he is, and he doesn't conform to our images. And the Bible teaches us who God is. The Bible shows us who God is. And when seeing scripture that describes to us who God is, it is our job to conform our image of God to the scripture's image of God. And the Bible is the scripture. The Bible is the word of God. It is infallible. It is what we base our entire faith upon. The Bible says in Romans ten seventeen, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Your faith in the Lord should come by reading the scripture and hearing the word preached. And the scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is that word inspiration means God breathed. Second Timothy 316 says all scripture is given by inspiration of God, which means that God breathed all scripture, scripture being the writings, the writings being the Bible. And so when you open up the Bible, it is dependable. It is accurate. It is what it is. And that is where we draw the image of God. Okay. That's where we draw our concept of who God is. We can form our idea of who God is to what the scripture says. So who we see as being God needs to come straight from the scriptures. Uh, Many Christians don't do this. To many Christians, God is love and he's always love and God never gets angry and God doesn't pour his wrath out on anybody. The Bible teaches that God does have anger. God does pour his wrath out upon sin. 
and those who continue in sin will see their will see themselves destroyed by God's wrath because of their sin. So we we have to have that we have to have that proper understanding of who God is, what he values and what he hates. Now God also forgives sin and he paid the price for our sins by sending Jesus Christ to die on our to die on the cross on behalf of our on behalf of us to take the punishment for our sins. And so you see God is being graceful and loving in that regard. And where do we get that idea? That idea comes out of the Bible. So we need to conform our image of God, who we think God is, to what the Bible says about God. Many Christians disobey the Holy Spirit's leadership. Many Christians will sin even though they know it's wrong. And all this is kicking against the pricks. It's painful. It results in confrontations with God. It leads to destruction. And this, these things happen because people follow the desires of their flesh as opposed to conforming their lives and their wills with uh, God's will and with God's word. And so we have to be careful that in whatever we do, we're not rebelling against the Lord. So we've talked about kicking against the pricks. Next, let's talk about persecuting Christ. Now, Saul persecuted the apostle Paul in the name of Saul, persecuted Jesus Christ. In verse 14, Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? In verse 15, Jesus says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. So Jesus charged Paul with persecuting him. And Paul didn't argue, oh, I wasn't persecuting you. I was just persecuting these other crazy people. Paul didn't argue with that. He knew exactly who he was fighting against and who he was persecuting. You see, in persecuting God's people, Paul was actually persecuting God himself. And this happens in the world today. The world today cannot persecute God. The world today cannot hurt God. The world today cannot hurt Jesus. So in order to hurt them, the world today seeks to hurt his people. Now, this is how Paul persecuted Christ. In verse 9, Paul says, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Paul thought that he should do many things contrary to the name of Jesus. His mission was to oppose Christianity. His mission was to oppose the spread of Christianity. And many people today have set their mission to oppose Christianity and to oppose the spread of Christianity. The atheist is opposed to the idea of God's existence, and he is opposed to any literature, any any publication that acknowledges that God exists. Any scientist who concedes that there may have been an intelligent design or creator being is lambasted in the eyes of the atheist. And you have seen debates here over the past year between uh, creation scientists and atheistic scientists And you have seen that at work. You have those who are opposed to the idea of God's existence, and so they will oppose that at every turn. Textbooks, you know, you have the controversy over science textbooks in the state of Texas. Now, in the state of Texas, the teaching, the idea is to teach both sides, that there could be intelligent design to this, that there may not be intelligent design to this. And your atheist doesn't want the intelligent design side of the story told. And Morgan Freeman, as much as I like watching his movies and as much as I get a kick out of his deep voice and the gravitas that he brings to the characters that he portrays, he doesn't believe in God's existence. And he is opposed to teaching about the existence of God because he doesn't see it in scientific data that God exists. And so you have that. You have people who have set their minds to fight against the teaching of God's existence because they don't believe he exists. Therefore, nobody should believe he exists. So you have those who are opposing Christianity on that side. Now, GLAD, which is a uh, which is an advocacy group for the homosexual lifestyle, they oppose teaching against the uh, the homosexual lifestyle. And of course, you know, that this thing gets all controversial and crazy. But when you have city ordinances that are being passed in San Antonio and then another one that I think is being proposed in the city of Houston that you're not even allowed to speak against it. That's a, that's a verbal discrimination or discrimination in word, and you can be punished for that. Well, that goes against the very things that America stands for in the way of free speech and a free exercise of religion. But the reason that these ordinances come up is because people are opposed to the spread of Christianity and the Christian message that uh, that homosexual acts are indeed sinful. And then you have, then there's another group that opposes the spread of Christianity and they oppose Christians and, and 
you wouldn't think it because they call themselves Christians, but you have what's called emergent Christianity or emerging Christianity or the emergent church or the emerging church. And what these guys are doing is they are de- basically what they believe in doing is deconstructing Christianity as we know it and building something totally new and calling it Christianity. They'll keep the name Jesus Christ, but they'll do away with the Bible. They will keep the the, the word church, but the expression of the church is totally different. We know a church to be a local congregation of believers who have been scripturally baptized, who have come together to carry out the Lord's work, whereas the emergent Christian, his idea of a church is, you know, two or three Christians sit down and have coffee. That was church that week. I mean, that's it's it's a lot more. It goes a lot deeper than that. But there are those even who call themselves Christians who are opposed to Christianity. And you know who these people are because they're, they'll, they'll tell you that they're a non-traditional Christian or they'll tell you that they're opposed to mainstream Christianity or they'll tell, you, they'll tell you that every other church in town is wrong. They're the only ones that have the truth and that everything that you've been taught from a child out of the Bible is wrong in one form or the other. Uh, by the way, if you're a member of a congregation and that congregation's message is that they're the only congregation in town that's got the, uh, that's got the truth, um, you are probably mixed up in the wrong kind of organization. Um, at Grace Point, we believe in the Bible. We believe in following the Bible. We believe in biblical doctrine. But I'm not going to sit here and tell you that we're the only church in town that is preaching the truth. I know that there are others. Uh, we got started up in 2008 with a mission of reaching those who were not already involved in a local church. And we have seen God bless in that mission. But I want you to be aware of people who are opposed to Christianity, many of whom call themselves Christians. All right. And so Paul, he persecuted Christ by setting his mission to oppose Christ. And then he persecuted Christ by persecuting his people. You look in verse 10, Paul says, which thing I also did in Jerusalem and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. He persecuted Christ by persecuting his people. In Matthew 25, 40, Jesus sets forth a biblical principle that says, whatever you do to God's people, you are doing to the Lord himself. And Jesus said in Matthew 25, 40, and the king shall answer and say unto them, verily I say unto you, insomuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. That's a biblical concept. Anything you do for or against the disciples of Jesus Christ, you do for or against Christ. So those who speak or act against Christians are speaking or acting against Christ. And those who persecute Christians, now this is going on all over the world. You have in overseas areas where Christians are being put to death for their faith. A very high profile case right now going on in the Sudan where a woman who is eight months pregnant has been sentenced to die for because she is refusing to renounce her faith. Uh, this is, uh, I'll let you read up on that. You can do a Google search on it, find out all about that that you need to know. Those who persecute Christians are persecuting Jesus Christ himself. And Paul goes on to say in verse 11, And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Paul was exceedingly mad against the Christians. Now, that word mad, now, you know, one day I got upset and I started yelling and the kid said dad was mad. Okay, well, we're going beyond that. This word mad means being enraged to the point of being crazy. Paul was so angry and enraged at the Christians that he was crazy about it. Paul was ludicrously angry with God's people. And when you find yourself in that boat where you're ludicrously angry against God's people, you're ludicrously angry against people, you find yourself in danger of persecuting others and you find yourself in danger of persecuting Christ. So we look at Paul and we say, well, man, that guy was really evil and kind of messed up before the Lord reached him. Glad I'm not like that. Well, let's make sure. Check your heart for a moment. And where do you stand with the Lord? Are you at peace with him or do you struggle with him? And are you willing to change your view of the Lord when faced with scripture that contradicts what you think the Lord is like? And where do you stand with God's people? Do you hate or are you angry with other Christians? Do all the other Christians of the world just not get it? Or are you able to fellowship with other Christians? 
And so we've talked about kicking against the pricks. That's resisting the Holy Spirit and fighting against the Holy Spirit. We've talked about persecuting Christ. That is where we fight against the people of God. Finally, let's talk about what we need to do to correct all this, and that's repentance. We look in Acts chapter 9, verse 6. Paul said, and he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Now here you see the apostle Paul, he's trembling, he's trembling. He's astonished, which means he is just blown over by this whole thing, and he's submitting to the Lord. To repent of hardness against God, you must first be willing to submit to him. Submit to who God really is. Follow God and his word and do what God wants you to do with your life. Be willing to submit to him. And then we go back to Acts chapter 26, and we look in verses 16 through 19. Jesus says, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith, which is in me. So to repent, first you submit to God, you surrender to him. And secondly, you realize that God has a purpose for your life. You know, God has a purpose for each and every one of us. We were created for a purpose. We weren't just created to sit here and roam around and wander around, try to figure things out till we die. God has a purpose for each and every one of us. Now for the apostle Paul, his purpose was to make him a minister to the Gentiles and to teach the gospel to the world to open people's eyes and show them the way from darkness to light, to show them the path from destruction to everlasting life. That was the mission and the calling that God had put on the life of the Apostle Paul. What's the mission and calling God has put on your life? I was getting ready to go broadcast a basketball game one day, and I went to the gymnasium, and the head girls varsity basketball coach was sweeping the gym floor and she would be waxing the floor a few minutes later. I was there extremely early. And she says, yep, now you get to see the not so glamorous part of this job. And of course, this was also a holiday. This was uh, New Year's Eve. It was Christmas break. She's up there sweeping and waxing the gym floor, get, getting prepared for the game that evening. And I said, well, I look at the work that y'all put into this. You teach classes, then you come out here and you coach. So you, you get up to the school at 7 a.m. You leave the school at 10 p.m. You have to do all the the grunt work and preparing the gymnasium and the fields and the equipment. I said, it's obviously a calling to be a high school or junior high coach. And she said, it definitely is. Each of you has a calling on your life, whether it is teaching, whether it's coaching, whether it's uh, helping with senior citizens to be a CNA in a nursing home and to do that on a long-term basis. That has to be a calling because that is some hard work. And CNA pay is not that great. You don't do that for the money. It has to be a calling, you know? God's created each of us for a purpose. He's placed a calling on each of our lives. And we see this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. The Bible says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God has created you to good works. God wants you to walk in those good works. In Jeremiah 1, 5, the Lord says, before I formed thee in the belly, and he's talking to Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. God created Jeremiah to be a prophet. What did he create you for? We were created for a purpose, and we are to be obedient to the Lord's purpose for us. And failure to follow that purpose will lead to destruction and unhappiness in our lives. So we look at the apostle Paul here. We look at his situation when he was saved and we see where he fought against the Lord. We see where he persecuted the Lord and we see where he refused to follow God's will for his life right up until the point that Jesus confronted him on the road to Damascus. That's the example we need to follow. If you are rebelling against God, if you're struggling against the Lord, against the Holy spirit, or you're not wanting to follow God's will for your life this morning. Today needs to be the day that you repent, that you stop, that you submit to God's will. And if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, let today be the day of salvation. 
would like to invite you to come visit with us today at Grace Point Missionary Baptist Church, Sunday school at 10 a.m., morning worship at 11. We meet inside the Early Chamber of Commerce building in Early, the Small Business Incubator Facility at 104 East Industrial in Early. Thank you, and may God bless you.